So welcome everyone. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Garavito. I'm a professor of clinical law here at NYU School of Law. And as some of you know, because some of you come regularly to our webinars, the CLX webinars, um, we host the Climate Law Accelerator, which I lead with colleagues here at NYU, hosts a series of conversations about uh, cutting edge research, cases, litigation campaigns, that try to push the boundaries in terms of what's possible uh, in, uh, on climate action. And today, of course, for some of you who are specialists in climate law and climate action, today is a special occasion because it's the beginning of the annual COP meeting. And in that context, uh, some of you may be asking yourself, why talk about the mycelial network communities and mycelial methods for action? And uh, I would like to give two reasons before introducing our colleagues and our collaborators in today's uh, event that uh, have resonated strongly with us here at NYU, uh, not only in the context of the work of CLX, but also in the context of the More Than Human Rights Project or MOTH uh, that is also co-sponsoring this event. First, you know, all the uh, discussions around climate tend to focus on animals, including human animals uh, and plants, and leave out uh, the third kingdom of life, uh, fungi, which as our colleague Juliana Furci, the head of the uh, Fungi Foundation, who uh, unfortunately cannot be cannot join us live, but will be listening in. She cannot speak because she doesn't have enough of a good connection. She reminds us that that's like leaving out a third of the king of, of the of the web of life. And in fact, uh, together with Merlin and Juliana and the Fungi Foundation, we launched a number of years ago, uh, the Triple F Initiative, the Triple uh, F fun Flora Fungi Fauna, uh, Fauna Fungi uh, Initiative that um, you can um, learn more about in the link that my colleague Jackie will drop in the, in the chat um, uh, box in a moment. But as importantly, one thing that I wanna highlight is that in our experience in working with uh, um, fungi researchers uh, and, uh, and advocates, there's a certain way in which the fungi community, the fungi experts community operates uh, and thinks that I think is hugely generative in moments of climate emergencies. I have never met uh, any professional group that's more, most collaborative and most generous, and that actually walks the talk of, of the subject matter, meaning how uh, they help connect different worlds, uh, how they adapt to uh, new circumstances, and how, in general, how much life there is around the work um, of, uh, of experts like the ones who are um, joining us today. And with that, uh, we're thrilled to welcome also today the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks, or, or SPUN. SPUN is a scientific organization dedicated to mapping, protecting, and harnessing the mycorrhizal networks that regulate the Earth's climate and ecosystems. To learn more about the work of SPUN, please visit the website, the link to which we've dropped in the chat box. Also, if you'd like to learn more about the need for legal protection for fungi, please visit the site of the Fungi Foundation and the site of the Triple F initiative. So we're going to do three things in today's uh, webinar. First, we're going to discuss the climate and ecological roles played by fungi and their vital roles within the living world. Second, ways to protect fungi and underground ecosystems uh, that can help address the coupled climate and bi biodiversity crisis. And finally, ways that fungal data sets could be deployed within environmental litigation and policy frameworks to leverage systemic change. We'll begin with two presentations. The first one will cover the basics of the role and importance of fungi, and the second will delve into the data sets on fungal diversity developed by SPUN. And to that end, we're delighted to welcome several excellent presenters and discussants. Uh, first, we'll hear from Merlin Sheldrake, who's a Dear colleague and friend, uh, Merlin is a biologist and author of Entangled Life, How Fungi Make Our Worlds, Change Our Minds, and Shape Our Futures, which has received so many accolades and prizes that it would take me uh, the rest of the webinar just to uh, summarize them. 
but Merlin is uh, also a research associate at the Bridge University Amsterdam and works with the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks and the Fungi Foundation. Then we'll hear from Michael Van Nuland, who's an ecologist and evolutionary biologist interested in plant microbiome, microbiome net relationships. Michael is currently the lead data scientist at, the, at, the, at SPAN, and he was previously a postdoc in the P-Lab at Stanford University, working on the, bio, on the bio, biography of fungal symbiosis and how they influence plant host distribution, species coexistence, and ecosystem functioning. Michael and Merle will then be joined by Toby Kears for the discussion portion of this webinar. Toby is the executive director and chief scientist at SPAN. She's a professor of evolutionary biology at the and university research chair at Bridge University, Amsterdam. Toby, Toby, Toby is globally recognized for his scientific work in the evolution of symbiotic trade and was awarded the E.O. Wilson Award for Natural History in 2021, as well as named as one of the 22 scientists playing a crucial role in expanding our understanding of biodiversity by the UN Committee on Biodiversity. Please, as always, please submit any questions you may have for any of our speakers in the Q&A box at the bottom. I will we'll have ample time, as always, uh, for questions from the audience at the end. So with that, I'll now pass it over to Merlin for his presentation. Thanks, Cesar, and thanks everyone for coming. And um, to um, what, what we think is a really important conversation. Uh, and one of the reasons it's an important conversation in our view is that Fungi are um, a kingdom of life that play a very, very important role in the biosphere, in the entire history of life that's led us to this place, and uh, and we're confident in the future of life that leads us forward from here. any number of substances. Um, some fungi can live on a rock. Um, they can eat them, digest the minerals in rock. Some fungi break down wood, um, which is a non-trivial challenge um, biochemically. Um, some fungi um, live in the fuel tanks of aircraft on kerosene. They have very diverse appetites, but um, but as they um, digest the world, they um, play very important roles in, in the vast, um, biogeochemical cycles that maintain the composition of the atmosphere um, and that uh, create soils that create the a space in which we live you know if fungi didn't decompose wood um the world would be piled deep in the uh, in unrotted forests so the ability of fungi to eat their their food to digest their surroundings with their uh, network forming ability and their chemical wizardry underlies very many of the fundamental processes that we often take for granted. So we can think of them as kind of ecosystem engineers. Um, 
And um, so, so part of the things that they, the fungi do uh, involve this digestion, this decomposition. And um, part of what they do involves the ways that they can form a, a remarkable relationships, symbiotic relationships with other organisms. And many of these relationships have changed the history of life. Um, one of these relationships is, is, is uh, a partnership formed between fungi and plants. Now, almost all plants form relationships with fungi called mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and these fungi live in and around plant roots. They extend into the soil um, and they are able with their network forming ability, um, with their chemical ingenuity to forage for minerals in the soil like nitrogen or phosphorus, which they trade with their plant partners. And the plants feed the fungus with uh, things that the fungi need that they can't get by themselves. Um, these are sugars and fats that the plant has produced in photosynthesis. So the plant supplies the fungi with sugars and fats and um, energy, in other words, energy containing carbon compounds. The fungi supply plants with mineral nutrients um, and um, together they make much of life on land possible. Um, and um, so this is one of the relationships that fungi form. I use this as an example because I think it illustrates the, um, the generative power uh, of, of fungal relationships and the ways that these relationships can really underlie uh, a lot of life on the planet that we take for granted uh, or perhaps take for granted. So um, these relationships are really important because um, mycorrhizal fungi, these fungi I'm describing, they're stationed at an entry point of carbon into the soil. The soil is a very important carbon um, uh, repository and um, plants push carbon underground to their fungal partners as part of this trading relationship. Um, and much of that carbon then enters the fungal network. It is, um, it then, um, can, it can be pushed into the uh, soil food webs, which are intricate, um, vastly important um, uh, food webs. That, um, about 25% of all known species live underground. Um, so many of these species are fed by the carbon that floods into the soil through these um, fungal networks. Um, and a lot of that carbon is stabilized in the soil through the action of these fungal networks. So um, this is just a broad context to, to set the scene for um, the, some of the ways that fungi are, um, are vital uh, ecosystem engineers, a sort of living scene, weaving much of life into relationship and underlying uh, vital life processes, and yet uh, are so often overlooked, um, taken for granted, or at least the things they do are taken for granted, but fungi themselves are, are overlooked and ignored. And, uh, and we think by turning our attention to fungi and the things that they do and the vital processes they oversee, that we can start to redress this balance and, um, and make the most of this vital lever in addressing climate and biodiversity crises. Um, so this lever, as we think, is uh, fairly uh, underused. It's basically unused, um, overlooked, fairly untouched. Uh, and there's a huge opportunity here uh, to work with fungi to address many of these crises. So I'll now hand over to Michael, who will um, explain a little bit more about the work of SPUN uh, and some of the ways that we're attempting to do this. Um, so thanks, Marlon. That was great. Um, I am going to share some of the details about the sampling and mapping work that uh, we've been doing at SPUN, mapping the biodiversity of mycorrhizal fungi around the world. Um, and I wanna start by talking about maps. Why maps? Maps have had this tremendous impact on our understanding of the natural world. Historically, they helped kickstart this new level of curiosity and a new wave of theories about the ecology that happens on the planet. Some examples of my favorite historical maps are these botanical geography illustrations that were inspired by some of Alexander von Humboldt's early work and started prompting questions like, why do plant communities change across mountain ranges? Or why are some species only found in certain habitats? Now, fast forward to modern day, and we have gotten incredibly good at mapping the above ground world. We have expansive plant surveys. We have highly detailed forest inventories. We're using drones and satellites like the image here to measure changes in vegetation from space. All of these efforts have enhanced our ability to describe biodiversity and understand the functioning of ecosystems across the planet. The issue is that ecology and our understanding of the natural world has advanced from this overwhelmingly above ground perspective. 
And as a result, we know so little about the distribution and diversity of soil organisms, the same organisms that control, we're learning so much about what we see and rely on above ground. We really need spatial data on underground biodiversity in order to more fully understand how ecosystems are working now and how we might help them become more healthier and more resilient in the future. And we think mycorrhizal fungi are a key group to focus on here. Like Merlin was describing, they're essential for establishing this dynamic link between above and below ground systems. Mycorrhizal fungi form symbioses with nearly all plant life on the planet, and they create these vast hyphal networks below ground. And these networks make up a large fraction of the living biological biomass in soil systems. They, they spread out and they go everywhere. Our recent analysis shows that a substantial amount of the carbon that plants are photosynthesizing gets traded to their mycorrhizal partners, about 3.6 gigatons of carbon per year. And that's equivalent to more than a third of the CO2 emissions from fossil fuels in, a, um, in 2022. So a huge amount of carbon is flowing into these fungal networks, which live below, below ground. And as Merlin was describing, that means these fungi are, are stationed at the key entry point for how a lot of carbon is moving into the soil. And at SPUN, we're exploring new ways that these fungal networks and soil carbon are interlinked so that we can start to account for the carbon dynamics of ecosystems more holistically by incorporating not only what we can measure above ground, like in forest biomass, but start thinking about how much carbon is locked up or um, flowing through these networks below ground. But how do we measure mycorrhizal fungi to do this? How do we see these underground reservoirs of biodiversity? A common method is to sequence the DNA from the soil and use those DNA sequences to identify fungal species. So if you're familiar with environmental DNA methods, the same ideas generally apply here. You collect soil samples in some standardized way. The DNA is then extracted from those samples and sequenced with these molecular barcodes that are specific to fungal organisms. Then those fungal DNA strands are matched to taxonomy databases to identify species. And as you start to collect more and more samples, you can start measuring how different fungal species are distributed among sites and how maybe the total community diversity of fungi changes depending on how many or which, which uh, variety of species are present in the sample. Now, these steps provide a really direct way to measure mycorrhizal fungi at a given site, which is helpful because as Merlin was saying, the mushrooms aren't always present maybe to go out and collect and identify. Um, but these methods can help you identify which organisms are at a site but it can be difficult to then take that information that you gain from sequencing at one site and apply it to areas where you haven't yet sampled. And at SPUN, we've been tackling that type of challenge using a global data set of fungal DNA sequences and building predictive maps of mycorrhizal biodiversity. This map shows the location of all the samples that have been compiled and processed together by one of our collaborators, Global Fungi, which is a, a group in um, the Czech Republic, which is doing a large data mining effort to gather all these DNA sequencing studies together. And this data set encompasses more than 30,000 soil collections around the world and nearly 3 billion unique fungal DNA sequences. So it's a massive amount of data. And we've taken this data with them and in collaboration with um, our collaborators to craft their lab at ETH Zurich. And we have combined the diversity prediction or the diversity calculations in each of these samples, which is noted, which is uh, reflected in the color gradient here, combine those diversity metrics with many different layers of environmental data, and we've combined them to train a geospatial uh, machine learning model. The details of the model are a bit too technical to get into here, but the main point is that an algorithm is trained to detect relationships between the diversity of fungal organisms and environmental conditions in the data. And once those relationships are identified, we can use them to basically fill in the gaps between samples. We can make predictions of biodiversity in areas where we haven't yet sampled um, in between these locations around the world, which then are predictions of biodiversity. Here's what some of those maps look like. So as we've completed this picture across um, all these different environmental spaces, this map shows output from these models of predicted mycorrhizal diversity. More yellow areas and the brightest yellow areas indicate mycorrhizal biodiversity hotspots, areas that we think are expected to have the most species-rich communities of these network-forming fungi. 
And one interesting thing that we've noticed as we started to analyze these maps is that our, our picture of what we think of diverse above ground ecosystems are like doesn't always translate to the below ground environment. In general, we're finding there's this really interesting disconnect between plant diversity and mycorrhizal fungal diversity globally, which means that if we want to protect the world's most highly diverse ecosystems from top to bottom, let's say, we can't only rely on these above ground indicators. Now, one way we've looked at this is by overlaying the world's protected areas on top of these global diversity maps. So here I'm showing a few zoomed in examples of uh, hotspot areas in different locations around, around the world, and then where there are nearby protected areas in these white polygons overlaid. And what you can see is that there are lots of yellow that are still uncovered by these sort of white polygons, which means that the hotspots are not fully being captured or fully being protected by the current um, protected areas or current conservation schemes in these different locations. Now, these are examples in grasslands in Argentina and Ethiopia and tropical forests in Mexico and Bangladesh. When we take this analysis global and estimate these numbers across the entire world, we find that more than 90% of the area of mycorrhizal hotspots is not currently protected, which represents you know, a major gap in past conservation efforts. But if we think about if we're more forward looking, this really presents an opportunity to improve our protection strategies going forward now that we have more of this spatial understanding of where there might be biodiversity hotspots, for instance, and that we can start using this to account for whole ecosystem protection strategies and not just focusing on the above ground component. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that it's really important to remember that these maps are outputs from statistical models, which means that there are there is uncertainty in these predictions. So this map shows in bright, yellow areas, areas where the model is struggling to accurately predict the diversity patterns of that region, either caused by maybe a lack of samples from those areas or high variability of samples that were processed in those areas. And this type of information about the uncertainty or the, the error rate of the model, let's say, is really important to present alongside the previous maps of biodiversity predictions. Because if we want this information to be useful and to be used carefully, if um, you know, we need we need information to know where the predictions are most confident or where we feel most accurate in the predictions, and where we may need to increase our understanding by either reducing the uncertainty here or getting more local information about the diversity of the region. And one way we're looking to ground truth these models to reduce the uncertainty in different areas is by working with local researchers around the world to collect samples and and boost our global understanding and the local research capacity of, of um, local communities in these regions as well. So this is also sort of a roadmap for us to say, here are areas where we really need to understand micro, mycorrhizal biodiversity more. So to wrap up, mycorrhizal fungi are one of the most widespread and ecologically impactful forms of symbiosis on the planet. And we believe that mapping underground diversity of mycorrhizal fungi can help correct some of the above ground bias that is really maybe stunted our understanding of the natural world to this point in a number of ways. Um, these maps can help provide a baseline now for monitoring mycorrhizal biodiversity change as we sort of set or established our current state of understanding. Um, and they will help advance our understanding of how ecosystems are working because of the significant role that these fungi play throughout environments. The main take home is that maps are going to continue to have this important impact on how we make sense of biodiversity around the world and how we make decisions about managing and protecting ecosystems. And because of this, we think it's really time to start mapping the underground with the same intensity and focus that we're, we've shown we're capable of in above ground ecosystems. So that's all I have prepared um, to share with you today. Thanks very much for your attention and looking forward to your questions later. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Merlin, for those very helpful uh, presentations. And uh, very clear, too, for those of us who are not specialists. Uh, we do have, uh, so for the audience, we're starting to take some questions in the Q&A um, uh, 
box here, but I'll get us started with a couple of questions uh, that relate very directly to uh, what Merlin and Michael shared. One is that, so the presentations today focused on the importance of fungi, as well as new data on fungal diversity. Now, in, in our experience, many environmental and conservation laws and policies only explicitly mention fauna and flora. Um, going back to what uh, Merlin said, but also asking you both to elaborate on that point. So what role, what role do you see uh, for the recognition of fungi as a separate kingdom of life in terms of environmental law and policy, including, including through efforts like the Triple uh, F initiative, uh, but also other efforts uh, to protect fungi and the ecosystems in which they're embedded. So I think that um, one of the key points is that all fauna, animal life, and flora, plant life, depend on fungi. So you can protect fauna and flora all you like, but unless fungi are also protected, those efforts are not going to be successful. So one of the opportunities that we see here is that by including fungi, um, we can both turbocharge uh, and support the efforts, uh, existing conservation efforts focused on fauna and flora, but also, um, crucially, it's not possible to you can't take a uh, like you can't take a um a fungal community out of the organ or out of the ecosystem in which it lives so if you're protecting the fungi of a, of a given area the funga um then you're also by default protecting that ecosystem because these fungi are so inextricably embedded within these ecosystems this kind of living seam um that it's a way to um, to leverage whole ecosystem change because um, because protecting fungi necessarily means protecting the places in which they live and all the creatures that they live with. So um, we see that as a, um, a, a potential strategic um, aspect of, of this fungal project. The other thing I think that we and why we're excited about this webinar in general is that we're scientists and we're collecting data and we have been collecting data for decades about just how important these underground systems are and fungi are in general. And so I think what we need help is really trying to lead that where where that data can be helpful, I think, for making the laws that are happening uh, where you are, because as scientists, it's 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 feeling pretty extreme in terms of what we're losing and how fast we're losing it. And so that's why I think, uh, you know, it, being invited to talk about this is so important right now because we need those legal frameworks that we just don't have. We just have lots of data. Thank you, Toby. That's crucial too. Uh, Michael, do you want to add uh, something to what's been said? No, I think those are great. Yeah, fungi are super important. They're they're everywhere, and yeah, we are swimming in data. We are gaining data insights by the day, and we would love to figure out how to communicate them effectively in, in more legal frameworks. I think that's a really exciting and important opportunity. Mm. Indeed. So in those terms, most of the conversation, and uh, as uh, I understood Michael's presentation, uh, the focus was mostly on diversity. Uh, and we have a couple of questions on diversity and a couple of questions on climate. Uh, so I'll start with the ones on, on climate because they relate more closely to the work of CLX, although we'll move on quickly to the other questions. Uh, one um, uh, audience member asks uh, whether SPAN studies are looking at abundance of fungi uh, and not just species rich richness, and in relation to carbon sequestration, does fungal uh, special richness, species richness have a causation or correlation with below ground carbon sequestration? and uh, let me add one here that's uh, partly related. Um, I don't understand all the terms, but you will, I hopefully. Uh, I hope. So what are your thoughts about the potential of endophytic fungi for increasing crop resilience to climate change and or increasing crop yields to help feed a growing population on less land per person? Yeah, I can take the, the first part of um, mm -hmm. our focus on species richness right now. So. Uh, the data set is really um, rich and there's many different ways we're approaching to um, tackle it. Right now we're looking at species diversity. That's one of our most um, uh, 
the one of the projects that's furthest along to share with everybody. But we have we're probing this data set for species abundance. We're looking at fungal traits, the diameter, the length of these fungal networks in in field environments. Um, we're tracing carbon flows through fungal networks. We're looking at community composition. We're looking at many many different aspects of of the uh, biodiversity and functioning of these fungal networks. And we have more and more data sets um, coming online soon, and we'll be able to share a lot of these data insights with the world. Um, right now, species the species richness component is the furthest along, which is um, one of the one of our main communication avenues right now. I'll let um, Toby and Merlin talk about the carbon carbon intersection with diversity and function too. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. Sorry, that's still <laughs> every time I start. Um, in terms of uh, the carbon um, diversity angle, it's something we're exploring right now. And we do see a positive correlation between a particular type of fungi, the ectomycorrhizal fungi that you typically find in forests um, and, and species richness with carbon stocks. So if you look at, we can look at remote sensing layers of, of uh, soil organic carbon and overlay those um, with species richness of mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see these bright spots that light up where you have both high species richness and high carbon storage. And those are places that we're really interested in going and exploring and understanding the functions of how those uh, fungal uh, species are related to carbon drawdown. And in general, we do see a positive correlation between carbon, soil organic carbon and, uh, and richness, so species diversity. Um, but that's with one particular type of fungi, the ectomycorrhizal fungi. There's another type, which are the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi that tend to be associated more with grasslands, some trees, um, and the major crops. And there the correlation between diversity and carbon drawdown are not as clear as with the ectomycorrhizae. Um, and I'm happy to take that last piece about endophytes, if um, which is that um, that yes, so all plants grow with the help of endophytes anyway. Without fungal endophytes, plants would not do the things that they do. Um, and there are all sorts of really exciting ways that we can start to become more mycologically literate um, to um, to try and understand these relationships better. That can either help plants defend themselves from disease or or give plants. Um, to different kinds of traits. So there are wonderful studies where um, people swap the endophytes growing in different um, grasses, very closely related grasses, and it gives the grasses different abilities. So you give the a salty seagrass um, the endophytes from a grass that lives in hot geothermal soils, and that salty seagrass can start living in hot geothermal soils. So there's huge potential here, um, and uh, I'd be really excited to see how this um, how this develops, this field develops as, as time goes by. Thank you all. One of the questions from Asaf uh, relates to legal actions for the protection of fungi, and I'm happy to speak to that a little bit and to what Toby said earlier. But uh, first, the question has to do also with whether there's a way to um, gauge, to assess the damage to fungi, uh, to fungal networks. Are the, is it possible to change variation in time in terms of the but uh, diversity and the the um, health of, uh, of fungal communities in ways that could potentially support a case that uh, tries to stop some sort of land use that's particularly detrimental to fungal networks. Yes, they could try. So I don't quite understand the question. So what are the threats and how we can recognize them in soil systems? Now the question literally is, uh, is there is a, it's a, it's a universal measure, some way to assess damage to the to fungal networks. Uh, and my, what I added is whether in your own data set, uh, you're thinking of um, collecting data across time that shows variation in, in fungal yes. uh, okay. networks. Yeah, no, that's very clear. Yes, no, definitely. There are markers. Um, for us, it's much easier to look at diversity as a, um, a metric for, um, for impact. Uh, what we see is that there are all kinds of threats in terms of logging, high intensity fires, common chemicals, things like uh, tillage, urbanization. All of those affect the diversity of the fungal networks themselves. And we see a severe reduction 
in the numbers of species when you have these threats. So not only are we sampling in pristine environments, but what SPUN is really dedicated to is also sampling in degraded habitats so we can really understand what it looks like both in pristine habitats and what is lost in communities um, that have um, that that have these that, that have fungal networks being destroyed the time question is incredibly important and so what we want to do now is set up particular sampling locations where we're dedicated to going back and getting a time resolved um, data set for these locations because communities can change rapidly um, not only over the season, so you can have seasonal changes, but of course, over the years and in, in determining how, how um, healthy that ecosystem is. And that's one of the things that we're calling on for mycologists all over the world is really to start leaning in to getting more time resolved data because that's something that we're, we're desperately missing right now. Thank you, Toby. Michael or Merlin, do you wanna uh, add anything to what Toby said? The, okay, so I'll add, go ahead. Mike. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is um, the DNA sequencing component is definitely one um, one very common way to to measure mycorrhizal fungi. But at um, at Spun, we are exploring other ways to potentially leverage um, other types of satellite data, like hyperspectral remote sensing, where these satellites fly around and they measure um, light reflectance. It's bouncing off the canopies of um, forest areas or or plant communities, and there may be I'm I'm hedging here because we we are still in the very pilot stages of this, but there may be a way to train models and sort of di dissect these hundreds of bands of of light wavelengths to use the plant canopy as a little bit of a microscope to understand what's going on below ground in terms of more rapid changes of biodiversity. And if this were possible, again, big if, but we are exploring this, this would rapidly advance our ability to. Um, you know, measure changes in mycorrhizal diversity across greater um, spatial and, temp and temporal resolution by leveraging the satellite data. So, you, so we are definitely exploring lots of different ways to do this. We're also going sort of the other way, the molecular way, and um, working with some um, some companies and some folks to try and um, get these portable DNA sequencers out into the field to really advance the um, uh, lower the sort of cost of barrier of sequencing fungal communities at the sort of ground level to increase our ground truthing and also just in, increase our understanding um, of mycorrhizal community change more rapidly, potentially at, um, even in the field, rather than needing to collect soils and take them back to a lab and maybe send them to a third party sequencer and wait for a month to get the data back. Like it's a whole long process. If we could do this in the field and if we could do this with satellites, we're we're right at the beginning stages of really advancing our ability to monitor mycorrhizal fungi more, more intensely across the world. Thank you. And I'll add uh, just a, um, an idea on the other part of the question that Asaf uh, raised about whether or not there is a legal action, uh, precedence for legal action or protection for protection of fungi uh, and not necessarily related to uh, climate impact. The short answer is no. We looked carefully at potential precedents in many jurisdictions here as part of the F initiative, and we didn't find anything uh, that was framed in terms of the protection of, uh, of fungal networks as opposed to uh, trees or forests at large or specific species of animals. Uh, but there are paths toward that, towards that type of litigation, and that's exactly what we're exploring uh, with uh, colleagues here in the room. So, and, and but the, what Toby said about the importance of science uh, and uh, law collaborations is crucial because just like in climate litigation, science, the say attribution science and climate litigation have advanced hand in hand. Lawyers need the science to appear before a judge or to make a case before a legislative body uh, because by definition, as Merlin said, uh, fungi are more invisible to the human eye than other kingdoms of life. And it's more of a recent um, a trend to pay close attention to the uh, health of the underground network. So as science continues to map out and SPUN and SPUN's project continues to move forward, there will be much better data that we lawyers can use 
to go to court and ask for the protection of a specific ecosystem. And even uh, listening to the presenters today uh, gives me additional ideas. So for example, if there's a gap between the area that's protected legally by a certain legal framework, be it international or national, because it's been deemed as biodiverse from the point of view of animals and plants. But there is a gap, but that doesn't quite cover uh, and protect fungal diversity, as Michael said. Well, that gap can be interpreted creatively and some you can extend uh, the protection currently given to plants and, and animals by asking courts to apply those those uh, frameworks by analogy. I, I keep telling uh, Merlin and, and, and Juliana that that's exactly how anti-discrimination law operates. Uh, and it's a case of kind of discrimination against the fungi to put it kind of provocatively, but that's exactly how law has progressed in moving the boundary of legal and moral protection from say uh, men only to women uh, in in terms of voting rights one century ago, or uh, that's how um, uh, minorities of many sorts in many places have received legal protection that what had was part was previously denied. So there's there's ways, but there's nothing in terms of actual precedence. We I don't have time to. Um, uh, tell more, tell you more about what we've been doing, but we've been exploring uh, some jurisdictions and and again the data and the mapping that um, this team is uh, are producing will be crucial to any legal effort of that sort. So moving on to um, another question, Anatoly's asked. Uh, how do your mycorrhizal diversity, the biodiversity maps account for areas of localized by, by intense soil disturbance? For example, intensive agriculture or forestry that disrupt soil ecosystems. I think Toby already alluded to that, but if, if, if you, Toby, or anyone else uh, want to elaborate on that point, and Anatoly would be curious to hear more. I can jump in with a little bit of um, technical details about the model. So um, some of the environmental layers that we use in the model are directly related to human modification of the environment. Um, that a lot of them, or some of them are related to sort of intensity of agriculture, or there is a, um, a layer that is literally called human modification index, which represents sort of the um, urbanization or, or change in land cover from natural to um, more managed habitat. So there are those details in the model, and we're able to test you know, how diversity changes across gradients of those um, disturbances. And interestingly, the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi um, do seem to respond positively up to a point and with some amount of human modification. And we're kind of intrigued about what that means. Um, it's hard to sort of tease out the mechanisms there with our global study, but it could be something like as humans modify habitats, they um, it gives more um, advantages to certain types of plant species that form those arbuscular mycorrhizal associations. And so they're a little bit maybe unnaturally um, uh, improved or boosted in terms of abundance in those areas, which might link to their diversity. But um, there are definitely some connections between human disturbance of the environment and the diversity that we often think of as negative, but maybe there could be some, uh, we're seeing some interesting positive diversity signals as well that we're interested in exploring deeper about what they actually mean. Yeah, and just to jump in on that, thanks, Michael, is one of the one of the goals that we have um, at SPUN is to build what's called a threat index for soils so that we can actually preemptively try to pinpoint where we think the greatest threats to, to underground ecosystems are right now. And then you can overlay that threat index with a, the diversity index. And these are places then that really need urgent sampling because not only are they biodiversity hotspots, but they also are potentially threatened 
um, by um, by all of the things that can go wrong in the underground ecosystems, whether it's pollution or uh, urbanization or deforestation. So those are places that we need to get to very quickly. So we use that threat. One, one hope of ours is that conservation organizations will use this tool, this threat index, to help prioritize places that either need protection or need sampling fast before that biodiversity is lost. Thank you. We're getting to the last uh, stretch of our conversation. So I'll take a couple of questions that were asked earlier in the session. So one from Ariel um, asks um, whether symbiotic relationships are being tracked in this PUN database. We do have, um, yes, they are in a number of ways. I'm struggling to think of a specific example here, but um, there are aspects of sort of plant performance or um, plant productivity that we're incorporating into some of our um, new carbon analyses, which aren't quite ready to share yet, but essentially we're using some estimates of plant productivity to help us understand how much carbon is flowing below ground. So we do have information on sort of what the plants are doing or the health of the above ground ecosystem as well, linked to mycorrhizal diversity that we're, um, that we're definitely excited to, to dig into more. I think what we showed today is a real focus on the, the fungal organisms, but of course they are attached to the root systems of, of their plant partners above ground and affecting a lot of um, the activities and functioning of plants. And that's an important aspect to consider too. Thanks, Michael. There are a couple of questions uh, about uh, rights of nature legislation uh, and specifically Katie is asking whether you all have any data uh, for Ireland because Ireland is considering calling a referendum to include rights of nature in the constitution, which we're tracking with a lot of interest here. And also Keith uh, is asking whether um, it's easier or harder to extend rights of nature legislation and protection of fungi relative to other kingdoms of life. I'm happy to address the more legal aspect of this, but I'll, um, defer to you all first on, on the science and on the data. And I see that uh, Julie uh, Furci would like to come in. Um, Juliana, you wanna go now? Yes, hello everybody. Uh, um, sorry, I can't have video on. Just wanted to jump in on that and um, mention that there are some initiatives where fungi are being used as keystone species in the broader um, rights of nature um, uh, legal framework. Um, especially mycorrhizal fungi, where the specific association with a type of um, plant can give broader protection to the area where um, where the that symbiosis exists, because you can't separate the fungus from the territory. Whereas um, when looking at protecting the plant, for example, you could have some ex situ ex situ conservation. So. There's a big difference for in situ conservation tied to rights of nature when the subject of that legal right um, could potentially be a fungus. To say that that's really fascinating to hear about the island situation. We've been talking about um, going to do some sampling at island. There's some um, fascinating looking ecosystems, underground ecosystems there that that's showing up on our, our, our predictions. And, um, and uh, thanks for flagging that, it, it, this turbocharges. Uh, in my mind, that, that they need to go and to um, do some work there. Yeah, and in terms of um, the opportunity to include uh, fungal networks into legislation and litigation on rights of nature, this is something that we're working very actively uh, on. And perhaps uh, Jackie can drop the link to the Moth Rights Project uh, that everyone is welcome to check out and, and connect with. And um, the one minute version of the response that I would give uh, for now is that there is nothing um, um, standing in the way of extending the existing legislation and existing uh, jurisprudence on rights of nature to fungi, other than data and awareness of their importance. Uh, in many jurisdictions, uh, we're actively working in Ecuador, for instance, and planning a collaboration uh, there next year. Uh, forests have been recognized as subjects of rights, as have rivers. Um, 
also individual animals and some species uh, of animals. So there's nothing uh, about fungi that would uh, block any court or any legislation from not applying the same logic to uh, fungal networks and fungal and, and, and ecosystems that are rich in, in, uh, in fungal diversity. Uh, again, data is crucial. Uh, coupling uh, creative uh, legal argument with hard, uh, hard data and, and, and rigorous data is usually the winning combination. It certainly has been in major cases like the Los Cedros forest case in Ecuador, which by the way, did mention uh, fungal diversity in, in, in the ruling. So there's some initial efforts moving in that direction, but I can see it, it, this coming up more often in future legislation, hopefully in a referendum in, like in Ireland, but also in litigation in the short term. So last question, because we need to close in four minutes. Leslie Ortega asks, uh, asks, as a student looking to work in mycology sciences, how can I get involved with SPUN? This is great. So one of the things that we're, we're really proud of at SPUN is that we work with collaborators all around the world. So right now we have about 250 associated scientists um, in across the world, I think 53 different countries. And so what we've done is we've set up as part of our website ways to contact them. So these are all scientists that um, are either mycologists or working specifically on mycorrhizal fungi. And if you go to the website, you can look at all of these different scientists and see what they do. And, and you can search by all different, whether you're interested in climate or agriculture or diversity, because what we need to do is really connect these scientists to enthusiastic people. There's a lot of enthusiastic people and scientists really need help. So I think that's the first way is just to go look at the SPUN associates um, and then see if there's one um, in, in your area that is interested in, in, in working together. Because that's what we're hearing from the scientists is that there's a lot of ground to cover and they need help. So please do that and please contact SPUN directly. So literally a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so Merlin, Michael, any final words? I'm excited that this conversation is um, <clears throat> is underway and that um, I think there's huge opportunity here um, for creative legal thinking. And um, and so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a great, it's a great pleasure to, to, to be here, to be chatting and thank you all for coming. Yeah, I echo that too. It's, um spend a lot of time looking at data and making maps and things like that. So I'm really excited about sort of the beginnings of this conversation to, to see those data and those insights be used um, to protect these really, really important ecosystems and these really important organisms. Thank you all. And thanks, Michael, for showing those uh, maps. It did remind me of uh, Cosmo by uh, Alexander von Humboldt and then his maps. Um, and uh, you clearly are creating more sophisticated maps, uh, but they're just as beautiful. So thank you all. And thanks everyone for uh, attending this webinar. As you all know, we post the recordings of the webinars on our website. Um, and uh, this is very much, as Merlin said, an ongoing effort, the collaboration with SPUN. We're very excited about it with the Fungi Foundation, of course, uh, and with colleagues in the math project, we're definitely uh, committed to deepening uh, the work uh, for the protection of fungi and also legal action, creative legal action to make concrete progress uh, in that direction. Thanks everyone and see you next time.